That's especially lovely to hear from Ann Lewis. We've been working together for many, many years, and I'm very surprised that she hasn't asked you all if you're registered to vote and have you organized your neighborhoods <laughs> and your... <laughs> um, please continue to eat your dessert. I recommend the lemon thingies. They're very good. But I get to do the real dessert because I have been asked to the best of all possible worlds. I get to give three great women a great prize for a great cause. Uh, I think probably most of us in this room have in our lives at least one woman who should have been recognized and was not. So I hope we all might think of her or of them and bring them into the room with us because that will help us to understand how crucial this work is. So I bring with me Pauline Perlmutter Steinem, who was always described to me as a great woman because she had four sons, she kept a kosher table, and she was an educator. I owe to a feminist historian in Toledo, where we come from, uh, learning that in addition to those things, she was the first woman ever to be elected from the state of Ohio. In, before women had the vote nationally, she was elected to a school board. And why? Because she organized together with the anarchists and the socialists. They never told me that part. <laughs> <laughs> and saw to it that what we would now call sexual harassment, which was the way that women were kept away from the polls, gangs of men and boys who sexually harassed uh, women away from voting, uh, were defeated in their purpose because she got women to go to the polls in groups. So in the name of Pauline and in the name of, of each of you <clears throat> and your memories of, and your knowledge of people who should be around the campfire telling their stories because the Jewish Women's Archive is the current campfire. Um, I thank you very much for inviting me and for this, this work. Uh, I, we, we also, uh, I think, I don't know about you, but about once a week I get mad that I didn't know something. Why didn't they tell us that, right? Um, I have a button that says the truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, because we have one of, especially because I just learned we have one of the authors in the room, I wanted to say that my last year's big revelation uh, came from a book, an anthology, The Sexual Abuse of Jew Jewish Women During the Holocaust by Sonia Hedgepeth and uh, um, Rochelle Seidel. You want where are you? Stand, so we know, right. <laughs> An enormous, an enormous revelation after 60 years and much of this material the first time in English. Uh, and also At the Dark End of the Street by Danielle McGuire, which is nothing less than a retelling of the entire civil rights movement with, with women added. Uh, and I'm still discovering all of this as I'm sure we all are. Uh, the source of the button really was when I realized that the Iroquois Confederacy uh, in upstate New York and throughout Canada was this, the main inspiration for the suffrage movement. Did they ever tell us that? Did anybody tell you that? No, me either. So <laughs> we will know so much more thanks to the Jewish Women's Archive. Um, now, actually, um, the reason some of you may know that book is because the, that is the um, sexual abuse of Jewish women during the Holocaust is because our very first awardee, Elizabeth Sackler, gave that book and the project it engendered its very first hearing uh, at the Brooklyn Museum. Um, but I have to say that knowing that they would, uh, that I would go on about these three women forever because I love them, <laughs> they actually gave me something to read. Right? Okay. <laughs> when asked to describe a just world. Liz Sackler depicts one in which all people live in community with, with one another, where integrity and respect are held in the highest regard, 
and where dreams are supported. A self-proclaimed -pro matron of the arts, you see she transforms wherever she goes. One of her first undertakings, which brought her international acclaim, was her visionary project to begin the job of return and restitution of Native American ceremonial materials. I happen to know she tried to call it rematriate, but they made her call it <laughs> repatriate. <laughs> Liz states that all of her work, of all her work, this repatriation of Native American ceremonial materials came from a sense of connection to her own Jewish history. She then began to envision what has become the Elizabeth Sackler Center for Feminist Art at the Brooklyn Museum. Here we have a woman's name on a permanent venue for feminist art, insisting on the importance of feminist art because it ties the work not just to women, but also to a revolution for women's equity and justice. Liz constantly challenges the status quo with a distinctive drive and ambition to leave the world a better place. She embodies courage, compassion, and determination, true designations of a troublemaker. On behalf of the Jewish Women's Archive, I am so happy to present the first Making Trouble, Making History Award to my friend and sister, Dr. Elizabeth Sackler. Thank you, fellow troublemaker Gloria Steinem. Thank you to the Jewish Women's Archive founding director Gail Reamer, founding chair Barbara Dobkin, and current chair Prudence Steiner. Um, it's a brilliant, brilliant thing, the Jewish Women's Archive, uh, keeping our history. Uh, all too often I hear people say, um, and you know the rest, it's history, or the rest is history. And that kills it. And history is alive. History is living. History has to be within us. It has to be spoken by us, and we have to remind everybody. Because otherwise, people, like I'm starting to tend to do, forget. <laughs> um, very honored um, to be a co-recipient with Letty and Rebecca. And um, I want to thank Arnold Lehman, who's here today. He's the director of the Brooklyn Museum, and he has been my partner in crime on the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. And without Arnold, it wouldn't be. So I thank you, Arnold, and I thank the trustees of the Brooklyn Museum for supporting it so fully. To Judy Chicago, of course, uh, who is one of the loudest troublemakers of all time. Um, to my sister, Carol Master, uh, whose financial strategic foresight made so possible this center and much other things. And my brother, Arthur, who's here with me today, I thank you for your support. Catherine Morris, our wonderful curator at the center, thank you. And to my children, Laura and Michael, who are here, my dearest friend and brilliant co-conspirator, Barry Rosen, I thank you. And my grandchildren, who are not here today, but um, as they get older, uh, or as they're getting older, I think they're beginning to get a glimpse of the trouble that their grandmother has made, and uh, who shall be if all goes as planned, uh, and like all others of their generation, uh, the beneficiaries of all the trouble that I go to to make. I have spent the better part of my life making trouble, or conversely, I have been identifying the trouble and making it big enough trouble to the point of its extinction. And so this honor is wonderful. Uh, it's one of my rewards and satisfaction, actually, for having uh, made trouble as one of the greatest and sweetest. I've uh, spent almost one year this past year staring at ceilings 
while recovering from a trifecta of operations that significantly all related to my guts. And as you know, the guts are the core of us all. Well, my guts have been sliced and diced, and they have been removed and returned. They have been washed. They have been ironed. But I do believe the core of me has remained untouched. I still feel gutsy and still relish the idea, even though it doesn't sound like it, I do, of making more trouble. This award reminds me of the great colleagues and friends I have, Sherry Sandler, I thank you, and all of the new ones I will make. The Washington Post critic Blake Gopnik said at a lecture I attended a couple of years ago that he despised cliches, was adamantly opposed to their chronic usage, and by extension, I suppose, the use of riddles and perhaps idioms. Parenthetically, there is only one thing I can think of that is more annoying than hearing a speaker's remarks begin with reference to another is to hear a woman speaking at a woman's event referencing a man. <laughs> but, but what can I do? This seems especially doleful as I'm being recognized for groundbreaking work. But uh, here goes, in Blake's book, I'm beginning my remarks of thanks and gratitude with what I consider to be one of the most annoying, overused, unanswerable elementary school cliches and riddles. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? It's particularly ludicrous coming from this old hen. <laughs> Having spent the better part of 2011 watching seasons change from my bedroom through my window while my body fought to live and heal and mend and repair, both nature, nurture, and God were in my thoughts daily, hourly, in fact, by the minute, as I searched for the meaning of, the way of, and the why of life. By extensions, my musings, I concluded, isn't a chicken or an egg that comes first. It's the void. No chicken, no egg, just the void in the beginning. Now, this can become a speaker's dead end, as you know. An existentialist, no exit, but it is here that philosophers take a leap of non-logical faith and where troublemakers find their meat. It's the what's missing piece. What isn't happening that needs to be? Ah, yes, the problem inherent is the void. This is the rebel troublemaker's paradise, the place to get busy. It's a time to create. Some of my greatest pleasures have come from filling voids, as well as fighting the non-voids discrimination with inclusion, replaced injustice with righteousness, to dance, always dance, for freedom, for peace. I have not come one iota closer this past year to understanding the why of life. It's still a mystery to me. Are we here as witnesses, as co-creators, just because, or just to fill the void? Perhaps merely to fill time, cogs in a wheel of man-made, and I mean man-made, machine that's out of control, with nowhere to go. I don't know, but here we be. And it is what we do while we're here that gives meaning, at the very least, to oneself, if not to life, and perhaps, if we're lucky, to life's purpose. So we get to fill the time, fill the void, and in the wonderful word of Bokanonism and Kurt Vonnegut's Cat's Cradle, we are the mud that gets to stand up and look around, and that is our blessing. We also get the mud making trouble, and that is the joy. Having fun with the prospect of a whole three minutes, which is now more than three minutes, 
of your attention this morning, I played uh, games with free association stream of consciousness on Troublemaker. Here goes. Mischief is, oh, by the way, if any of these speak to you, resonate, talk to you, you're a troublemaker. Mischievous, antsy, unsatisfied, rebellious, thoughtful, delinquent, as in juvenile, seer, doer, perfectionist, meddler, knitter, weaver, dreamer, intuitive, impulsive, faithful, believer, certain, secure, confident, farsighted, short-sighted, risk-taker, gambler, selfish, seer, doer, dreamer, builder, architect, lover of life, believer, lighthearted, willful, demanding, clear, convoluted, complex, complicated, ruddy, desirous, soulful, construction worker, hammer, seductress, seducer. Then the idioms and alternative usages, declaratives, you are trouble. I see trouble coming. Here comes trouble. Warnings. Trouble is right around the corner. She is nothing but trouble. This is troublesome. Superstitions. Trouble comes in threes, and of course for us witches, bubble, bubble, boil, I'm trouble. Complaints. I have gone to a lot of trouble. The trouble with you is... It's a game I could play for hours, but the point's made. Trouble is woven into the fabric of our language, of our culture, our fears, our dreams, our lives. To turn trouble on its head upside down, to acknowledge its power, its elegance, its tenacity, and the guts of it is to know that without trouble, we wouldn't be alive. Thank you for honoring me for all the trouble I've made in my life. Thank you for including me with an outstanding list, outstanding list of troublemakers who I think have made bigger, more, and better trouble than I, so it's especially humbling and sweet to be in their company. And thank you for encouraging me to make more trouble. Friday, I acknowledged the 12th year since my mother's death on March 16th, 2000. I am going to end by repeating her favorite rhyme to me that I heard many, many times as I grew up. There once was a girl who had a little curl right in the middle of her forehead. And when she was good, she was very, very good. And my mother would say, and, not but, and, when she was bad, she was horrid. <laughs> so I thank you for lauding me, and I thank my mother. <laughs>